Good morning, Leighton. Thanks so much for taking time to talk to me today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Michaela. It's great to be here. So one of the things Fizzy has done with COVID is to be doing um, more for our newsletter. So I'm interviewing you now for Fizzy Link, which is a newsletter that goes out to all of our members. And what I'm really curious to talk to you about, given that you're currently the Chief Global Advisor at RMIT, you've been in that role since beginning of 2019, came into that role after a sabbatical prior to which you were the Deputy Head of Mission for the Australian Embassy in Vietnam for three years. You've done some really interesting things across your career, and I'm curious to talk to you about your leadership journey. But I wanted to start by asking you about that sabbatical, the period you had off between working in what must have been an incredibly intense role for three years in, in Vietnam, which is a country that I know we both know and love, and then coming into the role that reports into the vice chancellor around global relationships at RMIT. You talk to me about your sabbatical and what you did in that period of time. Yeah, of course, Michaela, I'd happily do that because it's one of my favourite things to talk about, actually. So uh, I was uh, 39 because I turned uh, 40 last year uh, and I, uh, I'm i a sole parent. So my son, when I left Vietnam, was about 15 months old uh, and I'd taken off four months uh during my posting in Vietnam, when I first adopted him, uh, when he was very little to to be the primary carer, but uh, that um, sabbatical year enabled me to be a full-time carer, full-time parent uh, to my son. So I did uh, a lot of things I had never done in my life. I went to uh, Mini Maestro's baby music class. I went yes. to baby swim class, uh, sang nursery rhymes in the freezing cold pool in the dead of Melbourne winter after living in Asia for, for five or six years, uh, baby gym class. Uh, and, uh, you know, I really spent the time uh, forming the relationship with my son, being a parent, uh, seeing what many uh, parents experience during their maternity leave uh, or breaks they take in their career uh, to raise their children. I did do a little bit of work um, and I did that during his periods of naps uh, or during uh, uh, overnight. For example, I did the recruitment for Department of Foreign Affairs graduates, which is uh, always a very competitive recruitment. And we did, I read a lot of Very intense. During that That's year. It's an intense process. But, but looking, um, on reflection, it was it was fantastic. It, you know, I, I'd always say to people, if it, you have an opportunity for a, a career pause or a career break, do it because uh, I think it's helped me today. It enabled me to reflect. It enabled me to reset, uh, to think about the the many, as you say, busy jobs I've had, uh, and to really uh, help uh, come to this role at RMIT with a fresh perspective. Uh, so it was a great, a great year off and also to reconnect with family because I've been living out of Melbourne where I grew up uh, for about 15 years. So I had some great time with mum and dad and with my sister and um, niece and nephew. So late you started another big job at RMIT as a sole parent of a young child and you've been a sole parent through COVID pandemic and all of us have seen our colleagues who've got young kids um, trying to navigate that world. How have you managed that? Yeah, uh, look, the first thing I should say is my son's in full-time childcare and we have fabulous childcare in Australia. And I'm really blessed that uh, he doesn't just go there and get cared for, but he goes there and learns. And every day he'll surprise me with a new fact, some which I'm starting to now have to Google myself. Uh, and uh, I think he's learning every day. Uh, but I've been able to balance it really uh, because RMIT has offered such a flexible uh, workspace. And many of the things that I did last year, we're at all now doing with COVID. So yes. you know, I, I would traditionally start a day quite early because I'm an early riser. I'd get a couple of hours work done first thing before my son would even wake up. Then I'd get him activated, get him to, to his childcare. I'd go to the gym because I, I need to do my gym uh, or a run uh, and then I'd get into work sort of when I could which around the mid-morning point uh, already having done a few hours work uh, but then in the evenings I'd use uh, Microsoft Teams, Zoom uh, to have my video calls often into the region 
now that's all standard practice. Uh, my son's still yeah. in child care, but I think one of my reflections about how I'm working now is I don't even think about whether I'm calling you just around the corner in Melbourne or whether I'm calling Europe. Uh, we, um, you know, the, the use of this technology has just really broken down those, um, those borders and made us all virtually uh, so much more connected. Mm. So late you bring a wealth of experience to this role working internationally and in leadership roles in Australia. So you've worked for DFAT across Asia. You've held some really interesting roles and I'm curious about the time in the Philippines and the typhoon. So let's kind of go back to where you where your career started because I'm curious about the journey to this point. I think one of the things, my reflections on talking to young people who are now very worried about what their career pathway looks like and how do I choose what it is that I'm going to be, to see the, the varied kind of career that you've had having studied law and then moved on to be the Chief of Staff for the Attorney General at a very young age. Can you talk a little bit about the, what you've traversed and, and what the connections are across your career journey? Yeah, sure, Michaela. Like, I think one thing that it's not in my professional bio, but one thing which was really formative for me was in year 12, actually, I did a dual recognition program. So I did vocational education at the same time as my VCE, and I did it in uh, hospitality. Uh, and uh, that then translated to me working in hotels as I studied commerce and law uh, in my 20s. And that's something I've kept with me today. I think I learned the importance of teamwork. Um, I learned resilience. Uh, we worked long hours. We did hotel openings across Melbourne. Uh, so that opportunity right back in my high school uh, really opened doors and, and then for me perspectives. Uh, and I brought that into my early graduate <laughs> roles as a lawyer. Uh, and uh, through to, as you say, in my late 20s when I was advisor and then chief of staff for the federal attorney general. Uh, it was a huge job, that job, and uh, I was very um, young, I guess, to be in that role. I was around people who on paper were, were far more experienced than I. Uh, but the way we survived in that role was not dissimilar to the way we survived back in, in the hotels, which was uh, the team uh, had clear responsibilities uh, the teams were empowered uh, to look after their, their particular areas of responsibilities, but we had a clear, clear course of where we were going. Uh, and uh, we would, in that role, uh, it was a common course for us to eat breakfast, lunch and dinner together as a team. We were working 50, 60 hour weeks, uh, but we always did it with a great team spirit uh, and it was fun to go to work. And I think that's been something which has been really important uh, throughout my whole career for me, which is I like to create an enjoyable environment for people. I like to have a laugh where we can, as well as be serious and get the job done. Uh, and they're some of my best memories uh, working in the Attorney General's office just because it, it was really such a great team environment. Uh, I think then you asked uh, uh, around how that transferred into the international environment yeah. uh, and you, you'd be familiar uh, with your time, I know when I was in Vietnam, you were in Cambodia, uh, and there's such tricky roles because obviously you're living in a different environment, but your job is to interface with foreign gov governments, uh, the community sector, mm. and in other international organisations, and um, uh, the diplomatic corps too. So uh, that was a really, uh, those roles were very interesting for me too. Uh, but what it affirmed was something I knew from my time in hotels, and I knew from my time at the Attorney General's office, which is relationships matter. Uh, your internal, your external relationships matter, uh, and you need to invest in those. And I've invested throughout my career in getting to know the people around me, to forming constructive working relationships and encouraging my teams to do the same. And it's through those relationships that we've been able to use those to broker solutions, issues, um, and move along, uh, move along things as 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 it's mattered. So I think the importance of relationships has been a critical feature throughout my career. One of the things that you've talked a bit about is the the um, having a creating and having a shared vision in terms of purpose and impact. You've talked a lot about that um, in in other conversations we've had. 
What what is it that you're most proud of in terms of the impact you were able to have in the role in Vietnam? Yeah, look, that's a very big question. Uh, and uh, I think I might pick up where I left off um, around the relationship. So I think of the Australian embassy in Vietnam, and we've got a we had over a hundred Vietnamese staff working for us, and many of those people have worked for Australia for over 20 years. Uh, diplomats come and go, but the nationals stay, and they really know what's happening. Uh, and I remember toward the end of my posting when I was a parent, uh, and we hosted a Vietnam was a host of APEC 2017, and uh, that meant the Australian Prime Minister was coming uh, to Vietnam. Uh, and uh, I went out to the team. I always have felt that um, the ideas are best generated through talking to your networks, through talking to your teams. Um, uh, and I went out to my team and I said, we know the Prime Minister's coming. Let's all have a think. Let's not answer it today, but let's have, all have a think individually and collectively what we could do uh, to really uh, be a bit different, to be a bit creative, to be a bit innovative, but through that, have a bit of impact uh, both in Australia and in Vietnam about uh, the, the strength of our, our relationship. And so we left it with everyone and uh, the team came back and it was the team's idea that let's let's get the Australian Prime Minister out on the street enjoying some Vietnamese street food because food is so important in Australia and to Vietnamese Australians then to Australians who, who love Viet Vietnam culture. Uh, and similarly, uh, this staff member who had worked at the embassy for many years recollected uh, at the last APEC, which was 20 years previously to that, uh, when an Australian Prime Minister had put on a green and gold tracksuit and gone out and had a run with the people of Vietnam and how yes. that just meant so much because uh, that um, Vietnamese people were not used to their leaders mingling uh, as ordinary citizens. Uh, so we put forward that idea and we put it to the Prime Minister and his office and they agreed it. And um, we were able to get the Prime Minister on the streets of Da Nang eating a banh mi sandwich with uh, celebrity chef Luke Nguyen. Uh, and we were able to both talk about the people to people links of our country, but also talk about the trade and investment because what people didn't know was that the, the sandwich bread uh, has wheat, which is imported from Australia, or the beef mm -hmm. could often be imported from Australia. So we're able to translate it into something meaningful. Uh, and the reason I talk about that story is, was we wouldn't have done that had we not opened up for ideas, had we not talked to our yeah. team, had we not embraced the people around us. And, you know, that was national news in Australia that night. Um, and it just came out of a conversation. So, you know, the best ideas come from conversations. And, uh, you know, you asked me what I'm most proud of in Vietnam. I'm not most proud of the fact that uh, an Australian Prime Minister ate street food. I'm most proud of the fact that we listened. We listened to the people around us and we helped use mm -hmm. those ideas to help take forward uh, the relationship between the two countries. Mm. And I think there's a really nice thread Leighton, in what you're talking about in terms of building trusting relationships with teams. Because if you don't have a trusting relationship with a team, they don't come to you and share their ideas. Yeah, absolutely. So Leighton, my last question. This is really tricky time for people thinking about their career, thinking about their study, thinking about, you know, what's life going to look like as we transition into we don't know what. What's what's your advice? You've had a very varied and rich and interesting kind of career that, that you wouldn't necessarily kind of map out as a young person, this is where you're going to go. What's what's your advice to, to people thinking about their career? Yeah, look, Michaela, it's it's a great question, but it's also a very difficult question because we're in the midst of it now. So much is changing professionally, personally. Uh, and in issues I'm interested in at the geopolitical level between countries and um, uh, and sort of societal structures. Uh, but to me, I think we need to go right back to the basics. And I think my advice would be uh, people uh, and human relationships are at the heart of everything. Uh, and I remember just, it's a very quick story, but I remember when I was working in the Philippines and we had this most devastating typhoon, Yolanda, mm. 2013, it, it took 7,000 lives. It was um, devastating. It was the, the worst typhoon to ever make landfall in human history. And 
our staff were thrown into this humanitarian response overnight with little preparedness. Uh, and it was the busiest I've ever been in my career, far busier than when I was chief of staff to the attorney general. Uh, highly stressful, highly emotional. But some things we did during that time is what made our response successful. And one very simple thing was making support available for our staff who were going through this and making that not only available, but in instances compulsory. And I remember staff coming back to me and saying, at the time we didn't think we needed it, but thank you for making that available because we actually did need it. Um, and I think we can get so absorbed in uh, technology uh, and the need to position for the future um, that we can forget the importance of people to people relationships, looking out for each other, and ultimately investing in our biggest assets, which is ourselves. Uh, so my advice to people would be focus on your human relationships, focus on your strong bonds. That will be more challenging uh, as we have to rely more on technology, but ultimately it's the path for success. I think that's incredibly good advice, Slayton, particularly given the the refrain that I keep hearing, this is a marathon, not a sprint. We're not we're not responding to a crisis that is in any way over now and investing in yourself, caring for the people around you and investing in the relationships you've got is the bedrock that we all need to have in place. So thank you very much for your time today. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Michaela, and congratulations to you on these series. I think they're a great initiative. So thank you. Thanks, Leighton.